Well, um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, what we want to do today is um, talk a little bit about a new program that um, MOCAD is uh, starting. Uh, it's a four-year program looking into cultural production here in Detroit. It's titled Detroit City. And we're beginning this program with three different chapters, Detroit Affinities, Detroit Speaks, and Detroit Stages. Um, yesterday evening we had the uh, kickoff of Detroit Affinities, which is um, it's, um, uh, ten s sequential solo exhibitions. Um, five are by uh, Detroit-based artists and five are by artists from elsewhere. Um, when I arrived here, and I think as part of my overall practice, context uh, and place plays a very um, important role in my curatorial thinking. And I began having conversations here at MOCA uh, about what it is to work in Detroit, uh, what is the history of the city and how does that affect the work that is made, or how does the work that is made here affect the city. Um, and um, I begin particularly um, my conversation here with Rebecca, who's right next to me, and I'm going to introduce all the speakers in a, in a moment, um, to think about uh, a project that somehow could uh, take stock of what is happening in the city here right now. And also because I felt like that there was an enormous interest in Detroit as a place, as a city, uh, elsewhere. And somehow I thought perhaps it is more appropriate for Detroiters or people who you know, live here um, to talk about it than having these outside views uh, happening. And of course, I've only come to Detroit um, here since uh, 2012, so I've been involved with the institution for the last two years, which meant that I was kind of uh, also dependent on a lot of people in the city to tell me uh, their thoughts about this. And um, this program, Detroit Speaks, is a little bit of an extension of that. It's a continuation of an examination that I started, and I see this really as a work in progress with a lot of other elements uh, coming and taking place over the next four years, which will also include other talks programs, other exhibitions, uh, group exhibitions uh, that we will stage in the Woodward Gallery or larger solo exhibitions of Detroit artists, really trying to look into um, various in, into, in various ways into what happens here. Um, our original idea was actually much more simple and more straightforward, and some of you might remember that we had a lot, um, we had a big group conversation here about a year and a half ago that Rebecca and I organized. Um, and our aim or our goal originally was to think about could we make uh, an overview show that sort of looks at what is happening in Detroit right now. And during the research that I did, uh, visiting countless studios over the last year, I really came to the conclusion that it was too fragmented. There were too many uh, directions, and I probably wouldn't be able to really bring together a cohesive show that would not have very big gaps or would... Um, and, and I also felt it became quite political, um, where uh, there were voices saying, oh, and this is where this question of the Detroit artist comes from. Oh, this person isn't a Detroit artist, he's only been here for two years. Or this person is not a Detroit artist, he left and then came back. And it's like, wow, there's like a lot of thought being given to the question, what is a Detroit artist? Um, and for me, it's like, what does that mean? For me, I mean, very straightforwardly, it would be someone who lives and works here, whether this is 10 years or a year or, you know, their whole life. So I wanted to uh, bring together a panel of... Um, locals who are involved in various capacities with the art scene here in Detroit to discuss this question and of course also with all of you here in the audience. Um, so let me just introduce the speakers that I've invited here today. So um, on our far right is uh, Michael Stone Richards who is a professor of literature, philosophy, visual studies, critical theory um, at the College for Creative Studies. Welcome. There's his latest book. And then to his left is Laura Mott, who is a curator for art and design at the Cranbrook Museum of Art. Uh, then we have uh, Jeffrey Abt, who is also a professor and professor at the Department of Art History here at Wayne State University. And then we have um, Rebecca here, Rebecca Matsey, who is, uh, has been with Bokeh for a really long time. Um, she was the first person to... Um, say hello to me when I arrived here a couple of years ago. And uh, she is the co-founder of uh, Trina Sophie's uh, 
a gallery artist run, bookshop, coffee place. I don't know, it's a, it's a new hybrid format. Uh, and um, yeah, she's been very involved uh, in the research around Detroit City and um, she and I had a very long conversation about this idea for Detroit City and the exhibition. So um, she was a little bit of uh, my partner in crime when we kicked that off. And in addition to uh, this conversation now, um, each of these um, four panelists will also do um, an individual presentation focusing on one specific aspect of the art scene here in Detroit that I discussed with them. So Rebecca is going to look into the history of galleries and alternative spaces. Jeffrey has done a lot of work on uh, the history of uh, institutions and exhibitions here in Detroit that he will talk about. Lauren will talk, uh, Laura will talk about um, significant artists that have emerged out of Detroit, um, looking at the history of individual artists or collectives. And then Michael um, is going to talk about the history of art education, both in um, the art academy and uh, MFA programs, as well as uh, the education in terms of art history and, and theory. So I already told you a little bit about what um, my thoughts are in terms of a Detroit artist, and perhaps um, I could start um, bringing in the panel and ask Michael to give us his thoughts on, uh, yeah, what is it a Detroit artist? What is, is there it? such a thing? Is there such a thing as a Detroit artist? Well, I've just learned today that um, on this panel of locals, I am now a local, okay? Um, I've come arrived. all the way from Paris and London to be a local, and it's taken me eight years. Um, so that's not, that's not bad going. Um, I want to start my reflections by reading from a catalog um, of an artist that I believe most people in this room would know, Paul Sch the late Paul Schwartz, um, a husband of um, Christine Monholland, a very fine poet. Um, and it was an exhibition that was curated by, when I started to think, of, to think about this panel discussion, I picked this up, it was in my library um, at home, and I picked this up and it was curated by somebody called Michel Spivak in 1999, the year after Paul Schwartz's death. And I was very impressed with Michel Spivak, who most of you will know as Michel Perron. Um, and it's a very simple sentence. Upon Paul's death, much too soon from cancer in April 1998, a chapter was closed in the history of Detroit art. And I want to take that, as it were, as, as an epigraph to, to ask, because of course, Paul Schwartz is part of the Cass Corridor movement, and my point is not that we should go into an extended conversation about the Cass Corridor so much as the self-consciousness involved in being able to say a chapter in Detroit art is closed. And I would like to suggest that that chapter is the closing of the chapter of what might be a modern art in Detroit. And that subsequently, the question will then become what is the contemporary art practices? What are the practices um, th that make for a contemporary Detroit art? I would also like to suggest two things very quickly. We can't ask the question, what is a Detroit artist, without asking the related question, what then is contemporary art? And what is it that makes art viable? That is to say, it's not, we cannot take the idea for art for granted. Uh, we cannot just simply repeat the formulas about feeling, subjectivity, which is just a misuse of the word subjectivity anyway, um, we have to ask, what is it that art does? What is it that makes art viable? Because it may not be viable for that much longer. Or if it is viable, it may not be viable as a communally agreed practice. And therefore, we should also need to ask then, what is the future of art? And I would say we cannot, cannot address those questions, the question of what is a Detroit artist, without those related question, which is why in the work that I've been doing, I've been completing uh, a, manus a book on the contemporary scene in Detroit. The essential criterion that I've given myself 
is that whatever art I discuss, the work of Mike Smith, whom I think is just one of the most important artists to have come out of Detroit in two decades, the work of Scott Hawking, um, the, Heidelberg, the Heidelberg Project, the Powerhouse Project, uh, there are many others that I could name. It must be something that is part of a national and international language of art concerns. Otherwise, I don't think that we could be having this conversation in a museum of contemporary art in Detroit at that time. So those would be my initial opening conversations. If we're going to ask what is it to be a Detroit artist, we have to ask uh, what is it that makes art viable, what is it that makes art contemporary, and then what would be the future of art. And those would be my opening thoughts. Well, thank you very much. I think one of the <clears throat> points that you touched upon mm -hmm. with uh, your remarks is also how, how can you define a Detroit artist or some form of local practice in an art world that understands itself as being entirely global at this point? And what are the relationships between uh, people here in Detroit and the practice of artists somewhere else. And I think one of the mm -hmm. things that we're trying to do with Detroit Affinities is exactly looking at that mm -hmm. situation. Are there points of connections between artists that are working and living here in Detroit and um, somewhere else? I always use the term Detroit-based artist rather than Detroit artist. Um, yes. And I think there is a, a distinction to be made. Um, let me, again, let me try to be brief. There is what I, the way that I construe your question is that there is a question of place. That in Detroit, the question of place is not only relevant, but is quite urgent. In a way that I don't think um, the question of place is really of any interest if we talk about art that is going on in New York, art that is going on in Paris. I just don't, there is a question of a historical memory uh, for both New York and Paris at certain moments. But I don't think um, after, say, the generation of the Situationist International, that, and that is to say, after the late, in the late 60s, 70s, when Paris was completely ancient, old Paris, whatever remained of an old Paris was, as um, the great um, social geographer Louis Chevalier said, Paris was assassinated. After that point, Paris becomes part of a relatively seamless global network. The question of place is not in French contemporary French art that relevant. I, in fact, I just don't think it's interesting. But there is a question of place in Detroit, and we can still ask that question of place. And to some extent, I think the question about a Detroit artist, what makes a Detroit artist, is partly to do with the question of place. But I think that it cannot work unless we put the international dimension into it as well. Yeah, I, I uh, absolutely agree. And I think the question arises also out of the concern of seeing perhaps a homogenization taking place around the world when you look at uh, the practice of artists, particularly artists that are based in larger art centers, cities like uh, London or New York, where the ideas, concepts, and uh, the aesthetics are almost interchangeable. And of course, that is not necessarily something that um, should be desired. Uh, Laura, you have been here also now for a while. Do you feel uh, you have arrived in Detroit? You're a Detroiter? Um, I've been here for 10 months. Um, you know, when actually I received the invitation for this panel, I was out to dinner with a group of artists in Detroit, and I held up my phone. I said, I can't do this, can I? Um, you know, I've been here for 10 months, and I'm the creator at Cranbrook, and so when people are being generous, they say that's in Metro Detroit. Um, and, you know, I think Cedric says something like, you know, you might be going into a firing squad. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm pretty fearless. Uh, <laughs> so I'm actually not here today to necessarily create a definition or tell the community what I think a Detroit artist is by any means. But I do think I can speak about what it is to work within a context. Um, but I've also um, been meeting the last 10 months you know, with a lot of artists. I spent a lot of time in the studios. So I'm actually in a very privileged position as a curator to be sort of a reservoir for everyone's sort of perceptions of the city. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what we talk about um, in every single conversation I have with, a, with an artist because this is a point of interest to varying degrees. Um, and I do believe the art world does function like an ecosystem. So for me, coming to the city, um, 
one of the reasons why I really wanted to be part of this conversation because it helps me sort of generate the kind of curator I need to be working with in this context. Um, and so, and this is unlike, I mean, I, I've spent the last four years living in Sweden. Um, in that context, I was always asked to essentially give an American perspective. Um, so that was something I was always sort of mm -hmm. up against, this very broad generalization of what an American perspective would be. Um, and I think, uh, but you know, and before that I was in San Francisco and then New York. So coming into Detroit and working within this context has made it very um, important for me to see what I need to do while I'm here um, and be part of this ecosystem, which doesn't have a lot of curators. And, you know, this is really about being very present um, and really working, really regarding artists' work with a seriousness and to think about how to make links, for instance, with other international artists and this sort of discourse beyond the city. Um, but going back to the conversation that I had at this dinner, um, it was very interesting to me because, you know, even what is a Detroit artist, when I received this email, it just led into a, a full night of conversation. And, um, you know, a couple of the artists actually expressed their frustration with this idea of being a Detroit artist because they didn't want to have their work always seen through that filter, that their work was, you know, functioning in, in other ways, their interest was not necessarily the subject of the city. Um, and then another artist felt completely opposite. They felt their work was needed to needed very much need the context of the city that there was sort of um, the potential of mischief here that isn't was unlike other places in America at the moment I'm actually very drawn to mischief so I, I love that sort of sentiment um, but sort of the consensus was felt that by living here to some respect they did kind of absorb this idea of, of you know they were part it was like a sponge like you're a Detroit artist you know they were functioning within this whether they liked it or not for better or for worse um, and, and I could actually relate to that because, you know, in, I arrived here and immediately I kind of absorbed the identity of Cranbrook. I was a representative of Cranbrook, even though I've had nothing to do with its history until 10 months ago. So it's been an interesting thing for me also to kind of negotiate um, my relationship with the city um, being from uh, Metro Detroit or working in Metro Detroit. Um, so, you know, I think... It was also very interesting, sort of the end, um, uh, you know, we talk, you know, very generally about these things. And this was what one of the artists sort of at the end of dinner said, um, as we kind of start to talk very specifically about our experiences with one another um, of living in the city, that it was when we start talking really broad generalizations that it all seems very absurd. It's sort of an impossible task to talk about what a Detroit artist is. But when you actually break it down, which is how we really function, on a conversational level, um, that we, when we were discussing what it was to work in Detroit as individuals, it was actually a very productive conversation. So I think it's something as we move forward to be wary of generalizations, kind of trying to pigeonhole everyone into one kind of uh, um, place, but also, you know, it, it may be impossible not to um, want to speak on behalf of the collective whole. But I also think this is not just a, a situation of Detroit. I mean, when you think about an artist who's um, working in Iran, we automatically sort of give their work sort of an urgent political agency. Um, and in someone who lives in New York, there is a sort of um, validation. We sort of assume a validation. And I think that as I've experienced out, you know, before moving to Detroit and since being here, there is a sort of level of like respect that people seem to think that collectively that Detroit is an interesting place at this very interesting time. And this is not the same situation for perhaps artists living in Des Moines or Dallas or Daytona, right? So, I mean, I think there's an interesting kind of currency there that I think also would be really um, a valuable talking point today. Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, you touched upon an interesting point there, um, that Detroit itself also <clears throat> can be very much used as a form of um, advertisement or a marketing tool. We have all seen the success of Shinola, the watchmaker, that comes from somewhere completely different, but embraces Detroit as a brand because it's seen as edgy, as gritty, as this uh, post-industrial wasteland that apparently somehow seems to be appealing um, and um, riding on that wave and um, really introducing also changes now to, to, to the city. And um, I noticed that when I speak about 
um, oh, I'm working at MoCAD in Detroit. Oh, that must be so interesting. There's this and this, like these, these ideas of, of uh, what Detroit is. And <clears throat> you immediately start thinking about artists who take houses apart. And, um, you know, this kind of very cliche um, that perhaps comes up and um, a form of, um, how you say that, materialization that, that uh, uh, comes uh, along immediately. Um, Jeffrey. Moving over to you. You've been here for a long time. <laughs> Not just 10 months. 20, 25 years. <clears throat> so this is, uh, yeah. Yes, um, I'm a settled immigrant. <laughs> a subtle difference. <laughs> yes. Um, I should say before I start, I have, I've prepared um, some remarks. Uh, and when um, Jen's... Um, pose the question, I really approached it from the perspective of an artist, really thinking about the fact that there might be a fair number of artists here, and perhaps even some of my own students, and indeed there are. Um, so uh, partly I approached this as an artist, as a teacher of artists, and also as a writer who works mostly in the domain of critical histories of museums. Randall Monroe, the canny genius behind the webcomic XKCD, just published a book titled, What If? Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions. The book is based on his carefully researched and amusingly illustrated answers to conundrums posed to him by followers of all ages. A journalist interviewing Monroe about the book asked if he'd received questions he couldn't answer. Monroe replied that a few readers had posed problems so disturbing he couldn't bear to pursue them. One, for example, was how cold one's teeth had to be to shatter when drinking hot coffee. I admire the empathy implicit in Monroe's response. The thought of shattering teeth was enough to stop him. The question, what is a Detroit artist, strikes me as similarly uncomfortable because as an artist as well as writer, it raises potentially divisive issues of civic identity in the context of an institution that, depending on how well we do our job this afternoon, has the power to act on our answers. This isn't a criticism of MOCAD, I want to emphasize. After all, like most other museums, it's an institutional product of and contributor to the social cultural superstructure of our region. Its mission, which requires it to function as an arbiter of taste and ideas to inform and to educate, demands in turn the museum's rigorous participation, even leadership, in the taxonomies of contemporary culture. For most artists, however, MOCAD's need to sort, classify, and rank can feel more than a little threatening. Thus, my immediate, admittedly empathetic response to what is a Detroit artist is deeply ambivalent. I'm not keen on contributing to the work of cultural bouncer, deciding who's admitted to or barred from any institutional club. No, I do believe it's possible to contemplate the question as though purely hypothetical, but it could only be so in contexts where nothing is at stake. For example, among art students hanging around a studio late at night, drinking beers, something which I hasten to add never happens at Wayne State University. <laughs> the, I recognized one laugh there. <laughs> um, the proximate reason for MOCAD's posing the question, however, is pragmatic, not conjectural. The museum, as Jens explains, is embarking on its Detroit City project and the exhibitions, performances, educational programs, and publication projects associated with it. In other words, it has skin in the game. In pursuing the project, MOCAD's following a fairly well-trodden path in the history of Detroit's cultural institutions, which, like the museum, have thus had to grapple with the same taxonomic question as a way of shaping missions, setting priorities, and marshalling resources. Indeed, we see in the history of Detroit's other institutions how their responses to questions of civic identity has had and continues to have a real impact on artists' careers. And permit me to offer a few examples. 
The Detroit Institute of Arts relations with local artists have waxed and waned over its nearly 130 years, depending on the interests of directors and curators, including Clyde Burroughs, Edgar Richardson, Sam Wagstaff, who was the curator during the Cass Corridor era, and Jan Vandermark. For instance, shortly after his arrival in 1987, Vandermark tried to institutionalize the museum's attention to local artists with his Michigan Artist Program, a series of exhibitions in the museum's former lower-level rental galleries. Unfortunately, the program petered out in the early 1990s due to budget cuts. Some Detroit artists, I recall from the time, uh, wondered why the museum enlarged its scope to Michigan artists rather than focusing on just Detroit artists. The answer, in part, was financial. By then, the museum was receiving nearly all its general operating support funds from the state of Michigan, not Detroit. It had to curry favor with legislators serving constituents in western and northern Michigan, not here. The Detroit Artist Market, which is just a block up on, on the other side of the street, established in 1932 as a means of helping artists help themselves during the darkest days of the Depression, had a clear definition of Detroit artists. That is, until, as Michel Foucault might have put it, the exteriority of the market's vicinity changed after the Second World War. The confluence of post-war housing shortages and low interest rate home loans for returning veterans sparked a suburban housing boom that in turn paved the way for returning uh, for an urban exodus throughout America and certainly here in Detroit. Before long, the artist market leadership found itself wrestling with what it meant by Detroit artists triggering related questions about the institution's focus, identity, and allocation of modest resources, questions that persist to this day. By and large, the Detroit artist market has erred on the side of being more inclusive rather than less so, but over the years, locals complained when artists were selected from what they considered to be too far afield or who were insufficiently representative of Detroit's immediate community by a whole variety of aesthetic and ethnic categories. From the late 1960s to the 1980s, the heyday of the Cass Corridor that Michael was referring to, the Cass Corridor movement, a variation of the same issue arose when young, art, young artists became con began congregating and producing the work that established what many celebrate as, to, as Detroit's uh, really only distinctive artistic movement. Yet as Nancy Michnik, a preeminent Cass Corridor artist, observed, of the many individuals associated with the group, she was the only one who was born and raised in the city, when this is a much smaller population region. The others all came from the suburbs, rural Michigan, or yet more distant places. Similar observations have arisen regarding the depictions of Detroit in contemporary visual culture, posing uncomfortable questions about who's earned the right, or who possesses the birthright, to represent Detroit to the world beyond. The Kresge Arts in Detroit program which is underwritten by the Kresge Foundation and began allocating fellowships in 2008, defines Detroit as three counties, Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne. From a population density standpoint, however, it's an outmoded model. The US Office of Management and Budget also defines population centers, also for the purposes of distributing money. The OMB, relying on census data updated every 10 years, slices up this region in one of two ways. First, the metropolitan statistical area consisting of Lapeer, Livingston, Macomb, Oakland, St. Clair, and Wayne counties, or second, the larger, consolidated statistical area which adds Genesee, Monroe, Washtenaw, and Lenawee counties. Both statistical regions obviously much larger than the tri-county area. Far more noteworthy, however, is another facet of the Kresge definition it limits fellowships to current legal residents. We have to stop and think about that for a second. Those who have resided in the area for the past two years at minimum. Perhaps, given the fellowship sums and publicity involved, the foundation is far more intense about confirming an artistic civic identity than most institutions. Awardees are asked to submit two years of documentary proof including income tax forms, plus utility bills, pay stubs, lease agreements, auto registration, et cetera, that are dated and addressed with the awardee's name at an address within metropolitan Detroit. The legality of residency is also crucial. 
Green card holders, i.e. permanent residents who are not U.S. citizens are eligible, but those in other visa categories, as well as undocumented residents, aren't. As my brief and admittedly unsystematic sketch shows, while MOCAD may be new to the question of what is a Detroit artist, for those of us living in this area, it's come up many, in many guises over the years, and it's led to many different and for artists real consequences. And I have one additional minor observation. My ambivalence about the question also has to do with its formulation. And I think Jen's alluded to that a little bit. Were it phrased, who's a Detroit artist, or who are Detroit artists, the question in my mind could be more generative. The what in what is a Detroit artist veers close to other potentially divisive queries about identity, particularly ethnicity. For example, the inter interrogatory, what is a Jew, familiar to me as a member of that particular tribe, I want to add, has a long peculiar history that, depending on who was asking it where, could lead to fatal danger, indifference, or, in fact, opportunity. The implications of the question in late 1930s Germany were very different than those in late 1940s Israel. Here in the United States, the question signals the anxieties of assimilation, tensions within modernity's secularizing ethos and religious faith, traditions and change, the affinities of the tribal versus the yearning for pluralism. I could go on. There are countless jokes among Jews about such matters, the punchline to a recent one being, I'm not really a Jew, I'm Jew-ish. <laughs> well, you know, they now have a, pro a film called Black-ish. I'm going to continue. There, there are more possibilities, Michael. <laughs> Having circulated through Detroit's art world and taught just a couple of blocks from here for over 20 years, 25 years, I've had many opportunities to observe area artists, especially students who grew up here and nearby, uh, I've watched them wrestle with questions of civic as well as personal identity. Institutions have a way of crafting answers that serve their needs. But for artists, it ain't so easy. And for those artists in our audience pressed to declare their civic identity but uncertain about how to express it, perhaps the best response is, I'm Detroit-ish. I'm glad you're bringing up the, the question of identity because <clears throat> it seems like it's something that we are all grappling with, um, whether we are Detroitish or Jewish. Um, but looking at the work I'm doing in New York at the Jewish Museum, uh, again, it's a very similar question. What is a Jew and what is a Detroit artist? And the idea of who is a Jew or who is a Detroit artist, I think is all contained in that one question that I posed. Obviously, you know that I wasn't trying to really find an answer to that question. It is rather the invitation to begin thinking about what it could mean or what it could be. Um, and um, very famous Jew, actually, um, someone uh, I often refer to and look to, Walter Benjamin, um, mentioned that um, the idea of home <clears throat> and an idea of identity that could be based on home is the first thing that um, he felt was suspended in at the beginning of uh, the 20th century. And that is something that sort of always stays in mind when I think about these questions. How do we define um, identity? And perhaps thinking about place is not necessarily um, the way to go anymore, um, given how we move around. And I mean, I've already seen on the panel, we all seem to have these uh, various uh, forms of identities that are made up of all these different types of experiences with different places and through that with different histories. Well, I agree with you and, and certainly Benjamin, uh, in, in many respects, I think, considered himself a kind of stateless uh, individual in many ways. Um, but I will return to my, I guess, core observation that I think artists experience that question differently than curators. Um, because curators really, as um, the creative intellects of institutions, uh, 
who are charged with determining programs do have to make decisions. And those decisions, when they come down to questions of classification and ranking and so forth, can to artists feel threatening. Um, Absolutely. And I think that, uh, I don't want to let that point go. No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> and at the same time, the institution or the curators also have the responsibility to uh, you know, point the, the, the finger on those questions and, and play their part in the constitution of, uh, of, an, of an identity, whether that is a local identity or a national identity. I mean, uh, what we do here at the museum <clears throat> hopefully will um, feed into even individual understandings of, of identity, not necessarily just you know, on, a, on a sort of collective level. And c could I just say very quickly, um, before we come to Rebecca, to Rebecca um, I, I, as usual, I, I've, I've always read and listened to Jeffrey with, with instruction and, and admiration, but I, I want to disagree somewhat, because um, I don't think it's a taxonomic question. I think it's a conceptual question. And the process that we're involved in is not one, it's a Socratic process. It is not one at which we can start by knowing the right question. It is not one by which we can begin knowing the correct formulation. The process of joining in this conversation is the process by which we come to an understanding, if we're incredibly lucky, a consensus wouldn't bank on it, um, about what the formulation might be. So that in fact, what this, I do not believe that this question could be asked at the MCA in Chicago, I, where I lived for 10 years. I absolutely don't. Maybe 20 years ago when the images, 30 years ago when the images movement there was strong. Um, I don't think this is a question that could be asked, asked there now. Because there are certain conditions that are prevalent here that are not prevalent in Chicago, San Francisco, New York, Paris, or London. So when we, one, a museum of contemporary art comes out of a tradition where art is reflexive, where we do not know what art is, we therefore must ask each time we make art, what is it that I'm involved in when I'm doing this thing that conveniently we call art? And what are the grounds? And the grounds are never merely aesthetic. They're social, they're political, they're economic, they're status, all kinds of things. It is, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, every Museum of Contemporary Art, comes out of that line of questioning a certain type of art where the reflexive dimension is automatically built in. And indeed, it becomes boringly institutional the moment we take for granted what we know, what we think we know. But Detroit is going through certain economic transformations, political transformations, social transformations, for which now art bears the responsibility of defining. So in this audience, asking the question about what could conceivably be Detroit art is in fact another way of addressing these other open-ended questions. And I don't think there's any way in which we can know what the right formulation would be of that question from the outset. This is the process by which we can get to that. That would be my a very quick initial response to, to that. It's a question of authority as well, I think, or who's been given authority to speak for a certain group of people. And I think that, <clears throat> by and large, there's still the understanding that museums or institutions such as museums or universities, other cultural institutions, are these places that have uh, the authority to answer these questions. Obviously, in our postmodern condition, which I still think is, is still um, um, where we find ourselves in the question <clears throat> such as what is a Detroit artist in the end is not a question that we really want to answer. It is part of a set of questions that... Uh, um, no, I'm saying something else, that we can't know that. I'm saying it's, before we get to authority, it's, it's only by participating in the process that we instruct ourselves no, no, I what it agree. is that we are seeking. I'm just saying no the way. condition that you describe is, has become possible because we have questioned the authority of the institutions. Otherwise, we would just go there and ask 
um, okay, what are we supposed to do? Who are we? Can you please tell us? Because that is what museums or libraries are. They store all the answers that have been given in the past, mm -hmm. books, paintings, sculptures. Mm -hmm. These are the answers to the questions of why are we here? Is there God? I mean, these very fundamental questions. Leave but him in, out of it. But in <laughs> the end, they're the exact same questions as when I ask, what is a Detroit artist? There's, there's a, you know, a question of, of who we are as people and who we are as society and what is a culture that we have constructed to agree on. All right, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us all about Detroit. Uh, well, I think back to also our initial conversations and why we got into so many. <laughs> no, no, I think it's better because then you can sort of like talk right. over it and can we can see you. Stuff? No. Okay. I just don't want you to be hiding behind the microphone. How's this? Okay. So um, when we first started talking about the possibility of a Detroit art group show, I hated that idea. And um, I also remember us debating a lot about how you could even showcase Detroit art. And I kept advocating for the position that, well, we were always showcasing Detroit art. We don't need to have a special Detroit art show. And then the conversation was also about, well, the idea would be to let this show be the first of many that would travel, and you can package it as a Detroit art show. And then that sort of became this debate about what is a Detroit artist, and I think when we were doing a lot of the studio visits, we were asking ourselves this question a lot because so much of the work was so different. It seemed like you couldn't actually define any tendencies or characteristics of a Detroit artist. Um, but if I were to take the bait, I think that there are a few things that I've been thinking about through this conversation, but also in advance of it. Um, one of them is even if you took the term Detroit out of it, I guess Detroit artists um, are defined by how you define the word artist. And in my mind, it might be different from what you might consider an artist because I think of musicians as artists. So when I think of a Detroit artist, I think of filmmakers as artists um, or poets or literary artists. And that's because of where we live because the city sort of has always existed, at least in my lifetime, outside of this establishment where you kind of define these different genres of what's happening. And so I think at MOCAD, MOCAD has always, you know, the leaders of MOCAD have always tried to make it clear that all of those different disciplines are art forms that are equally relevant. And music has become one of those um, forms that has been uh, so important to the city's art scene and to the um, artist network that exists even with um, others outside of the city that it, we found it very difficult to just stick musicians in this space and have them perform outside of the gallery. And so that was one thing that we were grappling with. Well, how does music fit into this picture? And then um, also another thing that I wanted to mention was just um, that I think because the place is so inextricably linked to the time, I think that a Detroit artist is something different um, depending on which generation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And others have alluded to that as well. But I even think there's a difference between what an artist in their 40s in Detroit might be doing versus what an artist in their 20s might be doing and whether or not there's even an artist in their 20s who's doing anything related to Detroit. Um, whereas if you have an artist in their 50s who've um, worked here, their work, I think, is more defined by the city itself. So it depends on the generation. I think a lot about the generation of elders who have really shaped this art scene, whether you're talking about music or film or, um, or visual arts, and what happens when they're gone, because they're the keepers of a cultural history that is crucial to where we are today. And so that we might see the city's art scene sh shift excuse me, dramatically when we lose um, all of those elders who are doing really important work. And so what is it the responsibility of you know, us as an institution possibly to, to make sure that that is um, part of the city's art history and, and understanding nationally or internationally of what a Detroit artist is. And then um, finally, I guess I would say that you can only really talk about tendencies. And if you're talking about them, I would say that for sure, um, because the city for 
for so long has existed outside of any real kind of consumer or material culture, that um, that you do have a city that is full of people who are kind of anti-brand and anti-establishment and um, and who are very self-determined people and who know how to um, do things for themselves and to deal with an identity that they're comfortable with and they, they don't mind sort of um, changing that identity repeatedly because they're not concerned whether others are defining them by that brand or not. <clears throat> it's interesting that what you say, I think in the end um, what you describe of course means that art is always um, the product of uh, the circumstances that it is exposed to and in which it is made and ex uh, exists in. Mm -hmm. um, and um, perhaps there, is, uh, there are circumstances that lend themselves more to artistic practices that sit outside the visual arts or outside of the classic understanding of an institution. I think that MoCAD is a very good example in the way that there's a form of hybridization actually taking place where there is certain elements that take place in the gallery, but as you say, there is also this, this space here where we have a lot of other activities going on, particularly with, with the focus on music. Mm -hmm. uh, but there might be others. <coughs> and, <coughs> Excuse me. Perhaps it's sort of like singles also uh, signals also uh, a shift within art itself. Maybe uh, something that Michael was uh, pointing towards to: Is it still viable to be an artist in the understanding of the 20th century? The individual who works in his studio and and reflects upon you know social political questions or purely formal and aesthetic ones. Uh, maybe that whole idea is beginning to be challenged and moved somewhere else, which of course then will also um, challenge the idea of, of the museum itself as we have known it. I have a question for Rebecca, actually. Do you think that the other communities that you're talking about in poetry, uh, music, are they having panels of self like being self-reflexive the way the art community is? No. I mean, they have these questions like, what is a Detroit musician? Because No, but I do think that they think of themselves as artists. I just think it's, you know, the more formal or traditional construct of the visual arts and all of that um, institutionalization and the language has come out of it. They don't think of musicians necessarily as artists or they don't think of poets as artists as often. So I guess it's who, whoever's doing the defining. I think I, um, the truth is I think probably most writers and musicians and, 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 and visual artists and, and other creators here in Detroit, makers I guess is the term I should use, um, uh, probably don't think about these matters very much. You know, they only come up, for example, if one is going to write an application, let's say for a Kresge Arts in Detroit fellowship application right, um, and is looking at the various categories and whether you're eligible or not, or it might come up um, in the context of whether one might see oneself as eligible for an exhibition in one institution or another. I mean, these are institutionally driven demands. I mean, I, I do recognize what you're saying, Michael, when you say that there's you know, something to be said for just the purely heuristic activity of you know, thinking about it, but um, you know, I'm reminded, in fact, I was thinking a little bit, really, just, it just intersected for me, you know, in the, in the comments that you made, Rebecca, and, and also yours, Michael, that, you know, at the very end of Michel Foucault's life, people accused him of, of in fact, even though he was celebrated as a post-structuralist thinker, as in fact, he was a very structuralist thinker. And, you know, because he was devoted his life to trying to show the hidden epistemologies, the sort of hidden structures and structures, and the way that those could shape um, both ideas and institutions. And I think in this kind of conversation, we see the intersection of these different worlds in a way. Um, but I do think institutions bring a different set of uh, framing questions and concerns, which is not to say that it's not worthy of a discussion, but I think that certainly, I mean, I, I know we all know, you know, from doing art, you know, visits with artists in their studios, probably these kinds of questions of identity are probably the first, the furthest things from their minds um, when they're working, because you're just trying to get something done, you know, and it, it really comes to this other kind of dialogue that we're having, that these other sorts of questions enter the picture, I think. No, <clears throat> I disagree. 
I think, I mean, this conversation about Detroit and, and uh, the artist's role in it and, and how that's perceived is, is happening, I think, uh, very informal conversations around dinner tables at openings. Um, that's where I, you know, when I'm having conversations with artists in their studios, that's where I have these conversations more than anywhere else. So I think, so I think there is, um, I mean, and there is this, this moment because of, there is a lot of international gaze on the city that, um, and, and there are, there is press, you know, heralding the arts is going to be um, like a, a real conduit for the Renaissance or whatever, and they use these like really grand terms, but you know, I think it is, and, and, and perhaps this is an anxiety, I mean, maybe there's just like, I'm not quite sure if I can really pinpoint it, but I do, I do find this not to be an institutional thing, I find it to be much more prolific than that. But, but do you think that conversation, those conversations are taking place because you are a curator? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm married to an artist. All my friends are artists. I don't like um, function. I don't like live in a hermetically sealed white box. <laughs> you know, I, I think Jeff, Jeffrey, there's another way that we could look at that question. I'm not sure if this is working. There's another way we could look at that question. At one level, I think you are absolutely right. We could use that old term. You know, um, the philosophy of science talks about ordinary science, and that the overwhelming majority of scientists are simply ordinary scientists. Only one or two in a generation um, become game changers, right? Mm -hmm. Only one or two change the whole vocabulary of the way in which most of us, most of the time, are participating in what we do because that's what we do. I don't think there's any controversy about that, but I think the controversy becomes, or the challenges come about, when certain artists, and Rebecca, I, I just take it for granted, I thought we all did, that the word art no longer means visual arts. It, 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 but in this respect, it means anyone who wants to think about what it is to be an artist. I think the challenge becomes when certain artists decide that they want to become part of the history of what they do, right? At that point, the moment you have that ambition, which is a crazy ambition, because only one or two people will get that status, and it often won't be dependent upon you alone as an artist. That's where the institutions, that's where the critics, the writers, the economy, are you in a community that has the economic density and complexity to support the possibility of that claim? that I could become a part of the history of art. At that point, I'm sorry, I don't think I know of a single example of any artist who has made it to that level whose work does not imply some question about what then is it that I'm involved in? What is this activity that I'm involved in? Jens has asked me at the end of the year to speak about education, and uh, I'm, I have a lot of negative things to say about education because I see almost no relationship whatsoever between the art being made in most art schools, not just my, my art school, most art schools, and what constitutes international art, or what constitutes national art. It doesn't stand a chance of being considered as part of a larger vocabulary. Now, for many, for some people, and I'm not sure if this would be Rebecca's position, so what? This is what we're doing in Detroit. It has a different purpose, it has a different function. Um, but most people want to have, to be able to live as artists, maybe a musician, maybe a poet who teaches in, in a college can subsidize, these have been traditional ways. All of the poets I know uh, that I'm familiar with, basically they're academics and then they can publish whatever they like, regardless of what people think about it. It is much more difficult to make a living as an artist. So I think the question, I agree with Laura that, no, this is a relevant question, but I think the question becomes acute. The moment you decide as an artist that you want to be part of the history of what you're making, whether you're a novelist, whether you're a poet, whether you're a, music, whether, you know, a musician, composer, or whether you are a visual artist. The moment you make that decision, then the game changes. The game changes altogether. Yeah, but I, I don't, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Michael. What I don't understand is, 
what that has to do with geography. I mean, I'm, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, indeed, I think for many artists, they do think about what they're doing in precisely the ways that you're discussing it. I think so, yeah. But um, I, uh, I, I, I do question what that would necessarily have to do with geography in terms of the history of any particular I think the geography, if I understand your, if I understand your um, question, Jeffrey, I said earlier that the question of what is or is not Detroit art, art, what is a Detroit artist, which is not the formulation of the question, it's only the beginning of the formulation of the question, I don't think could be asked in many other great cities. I just don't think that it could. It can be asked here, because, one, because the city has been in a depression, has been in a crisis. It's a question to do with crisis, and it's a question to do with transformation. So whether we like it or not, those transformations um, are taking place, and it's within that context, I think, that it becomes a relevant question. So here in Detroit, that question is, I think, linked to the transformation of the city. That, that's the way that I'm formulating it as a question also of place. Maybe yeah. in tw 20 years in the future, this will no longer be relevant. I think some might argue this is also a question of responsibility in a situation that this particular city finds itself in. Um, but what you were saying is also, I think every artist has that ambition. Every artist is in this moment where she or he begins a dialogue with whatever art be, be, became or uh, was before them, was produced before they arrived, before they started. Their, all their work is in dialogue with that and, of course, with uh, the current realities they're living in, whether that is art or social or political circumstances. Um, but I think you are right about why this question maybe couldn't uh, be asked this way in, in other cities. Um, in, in the US, and <clears throat> to me was also really asking, thinking about responsibility, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also think um, in terms of someone who arrived somewhat recently, um, there's so much international attention on the conversation about the collection of the DIA and the value of art and the relationship of art to a city um, and the value systems we have put into place. So I think it's another situation that we're dealing with. Um, yeah, when we talk about Detroit artists, we talk about being in this moment. And, and so there's really sort of uh, general questions of uh, where art plays in life, real life, real life crisis, um, that's being articulated and Detroit sort of become a place of conversation. It's, it's a, the pinpoint conversation, I think, for that as well. So I think it's interesting. Well, perhaps you should open the panel and see if there's some um, comments or questions in the audience. Um, I'm sure you're all very eager to participate. So um, how do we do that? Do we have a microphone in the audience? Oh, there's a microphone over there. So I think the idea is that you um, use that sad microphone over there. Or you just be very loud. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, Gina, do you want to introduce yourself? No. <laughs> I just did. My question was in response to what Michael was saying, the point that he was making just now, and trying to disaggregate you know, this aspect of the question, what is a Detroit artist? I was trying to disaggregate that piece regarding Detroit. That's the reason I asked the question about geography. No, I understand. Um, so for example, I mean, one way of elaborating, I think on the observation that Michael was making, um, if we talk about that notion of history and where artists come from, some, I'm not sure how many, but probably some artists still, I mean, people who are studying art 
in our schools nowadays would be aware of the CAS corridor and that that might in itself be viewed as part of one's history as an artist growing up in this region and respond to that. And so that might be an, an, an example, I would say, yes. you know, a positive example in terms of how you know, geography in that sense could you know, play a role in that. In terms of the larger question, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, for many artists, when they're training, their personal geographies may in fact, in, in, in just the way that I think Michael also articulated, have very little to do with Detroit. It might have to do with entirely different kinds of things. I mean, it's fascinating, there was a point, you know, I think in American um, art studies, art historical studies, in the second half of the 20th century, there's a lot of interest in regionalism. You know, and so Michael made reference to the Chicago Images, you know, which is sort of Chicago's regionalism. You could talk about the Bay Area painters in San Francisco. We could talk about the Cass Quarter in Detroit. And what, and you know, and the, and the point that I think Michael makes, which is well taken, is, um, you know, what happens when a city sort of reaches the level where that regionalism cloak falls away, you know, and Chicago has become a kind of international. That's you know, exactly so, right. Yeah, and so, um, you know, that and that does bring us back to the sort of other issue about Detroit. Although I, I still feel as though it's important, I'm gonna, I will keep coming back to this, that there is a way in which this conversation is structured from a position. And the position is that we're talking about this from a curatorial question. I don't think we're really talking about this in terms of a question of identity still. Although I think we're getting close to it. I mean, I think that the point that Michael was making is true. If you're talking about how a person's identity is, a for is formed as an artist, then we get into, a, I think, a different set of what I consider to be really generative issues then. Where does that come from? Well, I always like the notion of place better than talking about geographies. Place um, as a concept including the geography that you move in, but of course then also the histories that are connected to that and the uh, current realities of uh, the situation of that particular place. Um, I think there is a larger global discourse around the visual arts that uh, Michael was also um, referring to that is um, kind of dominant in certain places, um, whether those are like the bigger art centers, the places with uh, a lot of powerful galleries and big museums or art fairs or global biennials that take place all around the world that somehow um, try to come to uh, not an answer, but some form of temporary conclusion about what is it to be an artist in the 21st century or in this particular moment and what are the practices uh, that um, that are perhaps new to the game besides um, the classic you know, painting, sculpture, photography. I think, uh, Social practice, for example, is one of the things that we have uh, seen more and more. So there's a sort of redefinition perhaps, but um, I mentioned Benjamin before. What are the, the, the criteria that we use in order to build our identity uh, if home or place isn't really the one anymore? And I think we all struggle with that. We still haven't really come to a full understanding how we are really doing that. And I think that opening, there's a danger, but there's also a, um, a possibility of rethinking a lot of um, aspects that um, have been or seemed very determined or conclude, concluded and it seems like it's all opening up and maybe it's a moment of uh, imbalance. I don't know Was if this is... Was there somebody out there? Was there somebody who's going to ask a question? <coughs> Marcia? I thought I heard somebody with a microphone. There was a gentleman over there who had a question. Yes, please. Um, so I have uh, a comment partially and then maybe a question. So I would say from, from my perspective, using um, Rebecca's um, general definition of uh, say musician, poet as, as a maker, um, the last maybe 15 years, it was very easy to be a Detroit artist if you used those criteria, especially a musician, if you left Detroit. Then you could easily be a Detroit artist. Um, and then I think conversely, Detroit is becoming a place where it's making it easier for a San Franciscan artist, a Brooklyn-based artist, to be an artist by moving to Detroit. Um, and that's a generalization and an observation, but I think um, as this place congeals and starts to become an industry, then that fluid nature of trying to be a Detroit artist other places will go away, um, or that ease. 
So the, my next thing is like, what's at stake by answering this question? And that's what uh, a question that I have. I, th I think that's a, that that is the question. What is what is at stake? Um, and I think maybe a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Uh, and maybe Jeffrey's theme refrain that this is more curatorial than artist driven is touching on that. I don't entirely um, ag agree with that. What is at stake is the responsibility, to use Yen's term, the responsibility of self-definition. There is no other reason than this. It's, the respons it's built into the gene of modern and contemporary art practice that we must put our practice into question. This is why I can't accept the idea that one simply makes. I can leave people alone. If all you want to do is make, I will leave you alone. I will not come to your studio. I will not bother you. I will not ask you these silly, ridiculous questions. But if you want to be part of something called international art, if you want to be recognized beyond your local community, which not everyone needs to after all, let's, let's, let's face that, then modern and contemporary art have built into it that things are brought into quest, that things are brought into question. For that reason, in other words, there's a kind of fragility that is built into the very idea of art. For that reason, art becomes peculiarly appropriate for addressing cr questions of crisis. So what is the crisis in Detroit? The crisis, fundamentally, it's a crisis of representation, i.e., what Detroit, who's Detroit? And I would also like to add a temporal dimension to that, when was that Detroit? I was at a conference recently, I was invited to come join some Wayne State University fellows. Um, and they read something that I'd written, they survived it and said, could you come talk to us? And when I got there, they were talking about some article called, Is Detroit Dead? And they were all speaking rather te negatively about it, and I wanted to know immediately. Um, I said, I don't know who this person is, I now know it's a very distinguished urbanist, Peter Isinger, who used to be at Wayne State, is now at the New School, and he wrote a very short, superb piece, Is Detroit Dead? And my first question to my audience was, what does he mean by dead? I'd, and apparently nobody had asked that question, because it seemed, the longer the conversation went on, the more it seemed clear to me that what Isinger was saying was that there is a certain narrative of Detroit that is clearly finished. Clearly finished. It's been finished a long time, and we do not yet know what the new narrative is or will be. That's what the fight is. So, that, so what is at stake is actually posing these self-reflexive questions is part of the process of defining what is emerging as the new Detroit. I think is what there. is at stake is a shift in power and that if you answer the question, the mm -hmm. power shifts from the artist and mm -hmm. the self-determination that so clearly in my mind distinguishes mm -hmm. the freedom of creativity mm -hmm. in Detroit um, to a very easily packaged and marketable product that then becomes part of a culture that actually a lot of Detroit artists have resisted for so long because inherent in their work is the ability to have a freedom from all of that stuff. But then also I want to bring up um, uh, one of the most interesting examples of self-determination. <laughs> and it's even ridiculous to bring it up in this setting because I think what your particular question to me was how many people are having this panel discussion in another context because people think about who they are and what their place in history is all the time, I agree. Um, and so the term that I want to bring up that was self-defined is trip metal. <laughs> Does anyone, can you raise your hand if you know what trip metal is? One, two. <laughs> Do you, can, you, can you explain at all what it is? No. Interesting because it's very difficult to categorize, but it's um, a term that was coined by a group of musicians that are also artists. John Olson is one of them and he's represented by What Pipeline Gallery. Um, and it comes out of um, noise music and noise as performance um, and also noise as music, but it just, that I think in my mind, I'm just speaking for them, which they would hate, but um, 
in my mind, it distinguishes the type of music they were doing that was a little bit more melodic, although still extremely harsh and aggressive, um, and noise just didn't satisfy them. But I think what's so funny about it is that they would never be a part of this conversation, and they're still self-determining, and they're also still selling really well, and they're touring all the time, and they're part of an international community and will be part of the canon of music and part of performance, but it just it's upon them to, to define who they are and who they want to be. And I think that that's okay in this culture, but what I'm really concerned about is a bunch of other people who are defining what Detroit art is for the artists. Well, who defines it if not the people? What you're talking about, when you say that it's about power, a crisis of representation is necessarily about power. I am just not interested in making prescriptions. I'm not interested in what I would like to see. I'm interested in understanding what you're describing as a kind of micro-community. Mm -hmm. The nature of micro-communities is that they always exist within these larger structures. No one person or individual gets to define, or group, gets to define anything like a city. And it, it will have micro-communities, it will have commu competing communities, and they will all be competing over power. But that's the more that what, but that's the, what human beings. But the do. more that the media has this conversation, and the more that curators have this conversation internationally, the more that that, that will happen, where there will be prescriptions on what Detroit is. And that's is. simply to say that since we're dealing with representations, <clears throat> the images, beliefs, ideas, structures that we associate with these things, they have feedback. So, at a certain moment, I was, you know, I've been reading a lot about Fifth Estate. At a certain moment in the 1980s, that idea of a micro-community as being able to transform into a, quote, dominant ver version of Detroit may have been intellectually possible, but it's not anymore. It's absolutely not. And for me, this is simply a matter of observation that a lot of those micro-communities, this is the paradox, a lot of those micro-communities depended upon the impoverishment of the city. At the same time that those micro-communities, many of those ideas I find, comp I find really, really interesting, but I'm interested in what works in the modern world, um, at the same time that, say, there was no tax base for, that then led to absolutely piss-poor education for the African-American children in this, in this community. So the paradox there is the micro-community is only possible because of a collapsed community. And we have not been able to realize the, 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 the utopia that micro-communities were trying to envisage. But, so they but Detroit had an incredible cultural history and community before the collapse. Of course, but, Full all, of micro the, yes, but all big cities have... Big cities are not one thing, Rebecca. I'm trying to, there are always... Communities in parallel, communities in opposition, communities below the threshold, but at a certain moment, the threshold shifted, and that made, made Detroit possible as a kind of experimental living, and that time is running out. Yeah, it's that time is running out, and well, that's what the crisis is. That's it's, true. That's why that's we true. are all I, we agree going on to have that. this conversation. Yes. I think it's difficult to compare the different fields um, and their discourse, a level of discourse with each other, um, whether that is a music scene or now the, the context of art, just simply by those being very different um, articulations. But they're not, they're all intertwined now. I, I don't know if that's really true. I think that might be the case here in Detroit, but as you say, they don't talk about what is a Detroit artist, so I don't know where you see this intertwinedness. I think this is a question that we ask ourselves because of uh, the traditions um, that uh, visual arts has, or a sort of self-reflexive turn that took place in theory that we then in the art world have adopted, but that maybe took not place in other fields. Um, so I, I think um, there is certainly something to, um, to, the, the, to this fact that we constantly question ourselves. It's really not, I think, about creating a brand um, to sell products better. Uh, uh, if it any, is anything, I think it's rather the opposite. Uh, we're not trying to homogenize something by asking these questions, but we're actually opening things up and, and complicating them by answering, uh, uh, asking these questions.
Um, yeah. What do you think a Detroit artist is? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a million definitions for that. You know, it's what is a Detroiter? What is an artist? What is, as you say, an artist in Detroit 20 years ago? I mean, there's so many follow-up questions, so many possibilities, and I think that's why uh, I, I wanted to pose this question because I know that we haven't been, you know, we're not going to be able to find a definitive answer, and and. This is exactly what Detroit City as a project is about overall. It's not about what you say, uh, saying this is Detroit, this is Detroit, that is Detroit. It's impossible. And um, so perhaps one last question or two questions, yes. So then, but, but what, what pieces would you select? How would, how would you decide what is the Detroit part that you want to talk about? There is an exhibition up here that opened yesterday by an artist based in Detroit called John Maggie, which is the first of a whole series of exhibitions and you know programs around art that hopefully we can follow. And I'm just saying, it would be interesting to hear discussion about the work that you were showing. Yeah, we will have that. Um, actually, um, I can give you the date. Um, December 13th at 1 p.m. I Sorry? think, though, like one of the interesting things that you're saying is that I think you the need lack more patience. of can't any, happen all in one day. Uh, the lack of um, criticism has affected um, who Detroit artists are because they know that they can't rely on that conversation anymore, and so it's almost like, in some ways, they're creating a very different kind of work without it. I mean, I don't know. That that's actually and maybe a theory, these discussions actually take place. We're just not there when they take place, like at the dinner table with uh, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also think that uh, I mean we talk about the cast corridor movement, and that's a really artist. A movement is a very art historically driven uh, construction. It has a place. It has a time. It has a canon of artists that have been celebrated, and, and we can wrap our mind around it. it, it but people also are very nostalgic for this. And we're not doing that right now in contemporary art. I'm not going to be proclaiming movements. I'm not going to be sectioning artists together. Um, that's not interesting to me. Um, I think you know, contemporary discourse, where you want to open things up, we want to be, I mean, I think uh, this question is extremely important because how it's going to continue on to different dinner tables and different other conversations and micro communities after it um, and yeah that's my Dolores yes you know, I, I really appreciate all of you coming together today to present this um, but I relate mostly to what Jeffrey said when the question should be who is a Detroit artist rather than what because in saying what is a Detroit artist you are objectifying us you are reducing us to the objects we create. And I understand that curatorially, uh, the identity of the artist is with the work. And so there needs to be more discussion, but we always have to remember that the makers are people. And people define themselves by their own experiences. And that these, which is for Becca's point, that the art of 
people of my generation versus mm -hmm. people in their 40s versus people in their 20s are going to be very different. And those people in, in their 20s, their art will change as their experience changes. It will influence their work. Whether that experience changes with place, with economics, with education, so all of these factors, I think, come into it. And I think this kind of discussion has to continue. And I also agree with Lynn in saying that if we had what on the walls to refer to, the conversation may have been easier. Um, yes, I'm sensitive to what was said, but I would, I don't think, um, anyone on this. First thing, I mean, we, we didn't choose the title, but as, as I said earlier to, in response to Jeffrey, that it's only in the process of, of having this discussion that we can find out what the appropriate formulation might be. Um, and whether we use who or what, um, there's been a long tradition, I think, in modern art that tries to avoid that. I mean, there's one of the most famous essays that Heidegger wrote is the origin of the work of art, and it begins, um, what is a work of art? Something made by an artist. What is an, who, what is an artist? Someone who makes works of art. And then he goes, well, that's not very useful, all right? So that, in a way, part of the process of um, involving in the conversation is to say, we can't just repeat the established formulations it may be worth taking the risk to have something open that next time we have this conversation, we will say, okay, that's not the formulation that we're, that's not the formulation we're, going, um, we're going to use. I mean, I certainly, again, speaking for myself, I've, when I arrived here eight years ago, I was incredibly, incredibly lucky that, um, you know, the president of my college, Rick Rogers, gave me Marsha Mari's phone number. And I phoned Marsha, um, and she said, what are you doing? And I knew instinctively that I was meant to be doing whatever she wanted me to do. And she said, we're meeting at the Suzanne Hillbury Gallery this afternoon. This was in August of 2000, 2006. And that was part of the final stages of the planning for the opening of MOCAD. Um, for better part of three years, I threw myself into that art community. Um, Gina Reichert, who wouldn't introduce herself earlier, I think is one of our major, major artists with a national and international reputation in social practice, often drove me back <laughs> from those meetings. And so I don't think there's an insensitivity. That I learned a lot from just throwing myself in, be it, be it Gina, be it Scott Hawking, later on Mike, Mike Smith, whom I greatly, greatly admire, and so many others, Adam and Nicola, recently Adam Miller, Nicola Cooper, is, whose film work I've seen, whose paintings I admire. There's a lot going on, I, I, and I'm somebody who grew, grew up visiting the artist studio, but I'm also very keenly aware that the threshold as to what can Lynn gain, become part of the conversation, has shifted, and I think that it has shifted in a way that makes it extraordinarily difficult outside of being a city that is economically one of the leading cities of the world. It's made it extraordinarily difficult um, for certain works to rise to that level of visibility. And therefore, not just is it writing that we need, we need to ask ourselves also, what kind of writing do we need? Uh, and that, that, I think, is part of the conversation that I see this process as being a part of. Yeah, um, I just wanted to maybe say if, just a few things because this idea of the curatorial or the curator has come up a couple of times. And um, I think that that's part of uh, what, what, you, what is a curator, right? Um, I think that one of the responsibilities that I see having myself as a curator, of course, also has to do with education. And perhaps that is not necessarily always the case when you think about the practice of an artist. So I feel like I have the responsibility to ask these questions and open up these discourses. Whether or not artists are interested in that 
is not necessarily really my uh, first thought. I, I think more about the audiences in that way and, and how uh, do we place these activities that are being done, like John Maggie's work or other artists that we will present, into a larger cultural context, a larger historical context. Those are perhaps more of my concerns than um, um, wondering whether this is uh, something that um, comes out of the studio or comes out of the classroom. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it's just really about creating this platform in a larger context. Um, but there was another question over there. Um, this is a little bit a uh, hybrid of a uh, comment um, and also sort of a challenge to the audience, I suppose. Um, first of all, I'd like to really commend Zodka for posing this question because, um, you know, we should get this of the museum. Um, I feel that the museum as an institution is really being called to address both articulated very well about how artists themselves, about what kind of artists all went to place in history, unless you're truly a whole artist. Um, and the fact that, to Lynn's point, there is, a, there is a need for the ongoing here in the conversation to really flesh out and maybe become more comfortable with um, the idea that notions of artists in this community, uh, collectors in this community, When, uh, there's a course at U of M talk called The Stranger, and really the, the course comes down to the fact that strangers come in and they ignite fears. It's very interesting. And what happens to combine that type of stranger coming in to an environment where residents, natives, locals, whatever you want to call them, already feel estranged, that all of a sudden you have a multi-layered, very human predicaments. Um, and I think that MoCAD developing over the last eight years, or going on nine, what is it? Um, that this forum and the fact that you've chosen not to have a day, but an ongoing, almost a year or series of programs, um, makes me feel like this institution has truly arrived with what does it mean to be international and on the ground. And I'm just hoping that this audience will then invite two other guests to come to the next panel and all of them. In a year's time, we might have a series of, of livable feelings and thoughts, positions toward the unanswerable questions that we pose. I just, I feel deeply that we, we have a real museum now because the museum has become a forum for something that's difficult. So, No, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for all your uh, uh, great comments. I think one of the reasons why we begin with Detroit City was also our engagement very early on, when Elisha and I both arrived here early with our exhibition, The Past is Presence, looking at particular historical events and how they could potentially be represented by artists from the outside. And there was a lot of um, criticism, I would even say certain irrational aggressions <laughs> that came up. Um, just simply by the fact that there was no Detroit artist in the show, uh, or no artist who was based in Detroit. So um, then we looked at James Lee Byers, an artist that I considered uh, to be extremely important in the last 50, 60 years on the international discourse. And he was someone that I would mention in the same breath as Joseph Boyce, Marcel Brotas, and um, other artists of that generation, but realizing that his practice was almost unknown in, in, in Detroit, um, which I thought was a very interesting um, observation as well. So um, we kind of worked our way towards Detroit City, and now uh, we will be with this question you know, for the next four years in various ways. Um, so I hope you will join us for, for this ride and, and you know, be, as you were today, uh, participants and conversation partners. You know, uh, as I said before, we don't really have the answers to all these questions. We pretend to have them sometimes, but uh, most of the time you know, we're speculating as well. So I really want to thank all of you for coming today. And before we leave, I just wanted to um, say that Jeffrey is going to talk on fe February 21st. It's going to be our next um, Detroit Speak event. And then we have uh, Laura coming up.
um, um, March 21st. Um, and then the idea is that we all come back together after the four individual talks and you know, look at, at how this has developed. And there is a new microsite that we have launched um, yesterday uh, for Detroit City where all of these talks will be transcribed. There will be videos uh, that are being made that you see there um, for these talks, but also for the artists. We've made videos where we interview the artists and uh, we hope to really uh, over the next four years, populate that website with a lot of information and, and also your comments. You know, we're still working out how do we, you know, bring in the responses from the audiences and other members of the community. So please um, stay tuned for more. Thank you so much. Thank you.